Uh, can everybody hear me? Good, good, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to SharkFest. The, the, the goal of this conference is to bring together the developers of Wireshark and, and users and, and let everybody meet face to face and exchange ideas. And for the past, you know, I guess this is the fourth year we've been doing it, it's worked really well. And uh, it's, I have no doubt it's gonna work well again this year because once again, we have a, an amazing group of speakers lined up for you guys. And uh, um, there is one difference this year. The, the company that hosted SharkFest in the past, Case Technologies, was purchased last year by Riverbit. So now we have a new host. <laughs> um, the interesting thing about the Riverbit purchase is that we now have the creator of libpcap and tspdump, the creator of winpcap, and the creator of Wireshark all working together at the same place. And we thought you know, the three of us would maybe get up here and talk a little bit about the history of each project and, and you know, go over that, over that for you guys. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Steve McCann. Thanks, Gerald. So um, I thought I'd tell a very brief uh, picture here at this stage in the talk of, of my involvement in, in this packet capture world, um, since I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes talking more in depth about the history of, of PCAP and so forth. But um, when, about a year ago, when Loris and, and his, his business partner, John Bruno, showed up um, at our headquarters at Riverbed after our product teams figured out that it made a lot of sense for us to add packet capture um, capabilities to our network visibility products, um, Loris showed up and pitched his um, company and his business, and um, it was like, wow, this is really cool. This is stuff I worked on a long time ago, and it's been many years, but um, I realized back in the late 80s, um, I had uh, worked as a college student in this group at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab with this guy, Van Jacobson, who you may have heard of. Um, and Van uh, and I worked on this tool called TCP Dump. Um, underlying TCP Dump was a packet filtering mechanism that we put in the DSD kernel called the Berkeley Packet Filter. And we took that infrastructure, rolled it up into its own library, and created the PCAP library, and put that stuff out for open source on the net back in the early, early 90s. Um, that sort of had somewhat of a following. People started using this software for uh, network monitoring and packet capture and so forth. And, and around 94, 95 is sort of when my work ended on, in packet capture. I ended up uh, getting distracted with other things in, in, in network research. Um, and that's where Loris and Gerald came along and really built on that framework and, and made it much more mainstream with, with the work they did. So I'll let, hand off to Loris and let him tell his story. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, I got involved uh, in uh, packet capture and open source uh, around 10 years ago. It was the end of the 90s, and I was a graduate student at my university in northern Italy, Politecnico di Torino. You can probably tell from my accent that I'm not from the United States. <laughs> um, I started working uh, on packet capture because uh, I was looking for a project for my graduation, and. Uh, the, I went to the computer networks professor and uh, he asked me to build a network analyzer. He believed that the best way to teach computer networks to students was to let them see what uh, the packets that were transiting on, on the network. You probably know something about that since we are at the Warshaw conference. And uh, at the time there was uh, uh, no uh, um, tool to do that who would meet his requirements. His requirements were to have a free tool because he didn't have budget for that and uh, where to have uh, a tool that would run on Windows because that's what he had in, in the student, student labs. So he told me, build one. I didn't know where to start, of course. Uh, so I Googled packet capture. I actually, at the time, Alta Vista packet capture. <laughs> and uh, I, I found Steve's, Steve's work. So I found these re research papers. I found uh, you know, the, the TCP dump source code, the lip pickup source code, the BPF source code. So I started working on uh, that source code, and I made a, a Windows version, uh, which uh, uh, I ended up called the WinPickup. It's essentially the Windows port of the BPF driver and the libpickup uh, uh, packet capture library. And that became quite immediately pretty successful. So uh, I graduated six months later, and by the time, around uh, 80,000 people had downloaded the tool. And the reason why uh, that became uh, uh, so successful is uh, that uh, it um, uh, enabled many 
popular or soon to be popular open source tools like uh, Snort, like a map, uh, like Ethereal to finally run on the Windows platform, so to gain uh, broad visibility. Uh, I kept working uh, on Win Pickup uh, during my PhD at Politecnico di Torino, actually uh, with the help of uh, one of the uh, developers that, now, that then was part of Case and now is part of River Bay, Gianluca Vareni. I always tell the story that uh, uh, after Gianluca joined the project, uh, I was in charge of committing bugs in the CVS and he was in charge of fixing them. Uh, so that worked very well. <laughs> um, so um, it, at the same time, while Win Pickup was getting popular and used by you know man, many people, uh, as I was saying, other tools were getting popular. And, and among these tools, there was this uh, Ethereal, Ethereal, which was created by this fellow uh, from Kansas City called Gerard Combs, uh, who uh, was crazy enough to join Case Technologies the company that, that I started in 2005. Gerald came on board in 2006, and that's uh, essentially when Warshall was started. I, probably several of you remember the whole big deal of, of the project changing name in, uh, uh, in 2006. And yeah, exactly. So uh, the reason for, for the name change was that um, uh, when Gerald decided to join us with Case Technologies, uh, the assets for the project, like the website, uh, domain name, uh, and, and so on, were uh, owned by his previous employer, and at, at that point, we didn't have enough money to acquire them. So we didn't know what to do. We just followed the project and started a new one. And the developers, uh, you know, just followed us, actually followed Gerald. So that's when Warshall was started in uh, May 2006, right, Gerald? So maybe you want to say something about that. Uh, Um, in the middle late 90s, I was working at a small ISP in Kansas City, as Lars mentioned, and uh, we had we were a small ISP, but we had some pretty significant clients. And I had to you know troubleshoot the network once in a while. And our primary platforms were Linux and Solaris, and you didn't have a lot of options for you, know, you didn't have an interactive protocol analyzer on those platforms at the time. So I started a weekend project that got out of hand um, to. <laughs> <laughs> to basically develop a, an interactive protocol analyzer for those platforms. And uh, you know, the, I released it uh, in the fall of 1998, uh, actually late summer 1998, and you know, some of the people that are even here started contributing code. And you know, the project started taking off and doing well, and I thought we were doing pretty well just on Linux and Solaris, and, and then you know, the project was, was pretty popular, and, and then somebody ported it over to Windows using WinPCAP. And suddenly, we're really popular. And uh, the project just hasn't stopped growing since. And, and uh, as you can see here, it's just been an amazing journey. Um, and uh, as Loris mentioned, in 2006, you know, we had an issue with wireless capture on Windows. And I contacted Loris and said, you know, what can we do about this? And, and we ended up uh, working together. And, and you know, Loris developed AirPCAP. And that's kind of how the relationship got started. And that's you know how we ended up where we are today. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what happened? What happened after that is uh, we uh, grew Case Technologies uh, together uh, with uh, uh, Gerald uh, and uh, uh, my partner John Bruno and all the people at Case for around uh, five years. So the company was starting in two five, 2005, and. Uh, during the spring of 2010, we started talking with, uh, with this company called uh, uh, Riverbed. Um, we've uh, uh, been approached by many companies uh, uh, in the past, but uh, uh, when we started talking with this company, uh, we, we, we felt uh, it was different. Uh, 2010 was uh, an interesting year for me. Uh, let, let me get a bit, a, a bit personal. Uh, in 2010, uh, I sold my company to Riverbed. I had twin babies. <laughs> and uh, I built a new home, a new house, while living in it. <laughs> so uh, it's been an interesting year that uh, uh, I probably tell to my grandchild. And probably the biggest result uh, uh, after 2010 is that I'm, I'm still here. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm still here uh, all, also and especially thank to the, to the help of many people. One is my wife, Stacy. Uh, there are people uh, that uh, um, were uh, the ones that uh, helped a lot during the acquisition. The acquisition of a company is um, really a um, complicated, very long, and very stressful process. And uh, I, I would like to thank uh, two or three people, uh, Paul Brady, Glenn Brewer, and Dim Dimitri Vlakos for uh, doing this with us. Uh, and now after you know, a few months that we've worked together, I consider these people not only you know, good colleagues, but also friends. Uh, I would like to thank all the people at Case Technologies who honor me to build the company together. And uh, I would like to tell you uh, the story of one of, one of the first meetings uh, uh, when we started talking with, uh, with Riverbed. We were in this, in this room at the San Francisco headquarters and we had uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, technical people uh, in, the, in that room and I was uh, you know, pitching uh, our technology to these people and I was doing a, a, a bit of a whiteboard and uh, there was this guy sitting at the corner of the room that introduced himself as Steve McCann, the CTO of the company. Uh, I didn't think uh, about that at that point. But while I was driving home, I was like, it's that Steve McCann. <laughs> That's too cool. <laughs> the TCP dump guy, the lead pickup guy. Uh, I remember reading his paper. I started you know, my, my career in this field, uh, thank, thanks, you know, thanks to, to his work. So at that point, I, I was hooked. <laughs> uh, I, I thought it was, it was uh, you know, really cool that now Gerald, Steve, and I work for the same company. And I discovered. Uh, Again, working now for a few months together with Steve, that uh, uh, not only is, of course, you know, a very bright uh, uh, person, but is also, also been uh, probably one of the biggest advocates of Wireshark and open source, you know, and the power of, of the community inside Riverbed. So it's really been a person that uh, has enabled the case acquisition, but has also enabled us being, again, together and even more successfully this year. So now Steve will give the keynote of Sharpest. So welcome, Steve. Thanks, Loris. You're going to make me cry. So before I um, jump into my, uh, my sort of keynote talk, I want to say a couple other words. Um, so now with this acquisition, now that Riverbed is the sponsor of um, the Wireshark project, um, you know, our strategy here, as, as Loris was kind of alluding to, is we really don't want to mess it up. We want to keep you guys happy. We want to keep Gerald happy. Um, and we want to keep this thriving community going. We don't think of Wireshark at all as something we, we own or even could own. Uh, we think the community owns it uh, collectively. Um, and there's plenty of stuff for us to do as a, as a technology company around the Wireshark ecosystem and let Wireshark do what it does best, which is decode and analyze packets. Um, and so the more open and successful Wireshark becomes, the better it is for Riverbed. And as I've told Gerald a few times, if something bad happens, you know, Riverbed's not a huge company, but there are a lot of people here with ambition and so forth. And if somebody goes out and does something that's not consistent with the Wireshark mission and, and open source community, just let us know it was a mistake, and we'll fix it, and, and we'll make it right. So that's, that's sort of our philosophy. Um, and I wanted to tell a little story. I've, I've gotten to know the, the case team, and, and Loris in particular, really well over the past several months. Um, one of the things we've been doing is running around the world, talking to customers and partners um, about how our products come together, how we fit in with Wireshark, what the future of our platform is, and so forth. And, and we were out in Europe um, a few weeks ago. And I had the pleasure of visiting the little village in the Italian Alps where um, Loris grew up, a place called Venadio. And uh, we did, he showed me around, did a bunch of stuff, and one of the things we did was hiked up in the mountains. And he, sh he, sh he showed me these alpine peaks where um, he told me in the, in the middle of winter he would hike up to the top of these peaks and ski down them. No chairlifts, you know, no ski grooming equipment, um, uh, avalanche dangers, and so forth. And then he was telling me, about these waterfalls he would climb. And I'm like, how the heck do you climb a waterfall? Well, you wait till winter when it freezes, and then you use special equipment to climb up this, these waterfalls. And then apparently, you have to come some other way down because it's too dangerous to come down them. So I asked him, why do you do this? And he just kind of looked at me confused, like there's no words to explain, um, explain why you would do something like this. And I, 
I sort of um, think this is the same sort of spirit and behavior that would lead somebody to leave the Italian Alps, this little village, go to Davis, California, of all places, hook up with his business partner, John Bruno, recruit Gerald Combs from Kansas City um, with his vision that they could, they could build a company around this free software and it would work. Well, I think they, it did work and I think they built something very special and I would like to personally thank Gerald and Loris and, and John Bruno um, for this amazing project they put together where they put sort of the right amount of corporate touch and infrastructure around this community to make it all work. So thanks to you guys. A big round of applause. Okay, so with that little um, intro, I'm, I'm going to launch into this presentation. And when, when Janice last summer asked me if I could speak here at this conference, I thought, well, I haven't done anything in this area for years, so what would I talk about? So I thought, well, why don't I talk about the thing I did do, which was like 20 plus years ago. You guys are a pretty technical audience, so I thought I'd just give a sort of a technical presentation on the PCAP library and how I came about building it and how I met Van and Van Jacobson and all of that. So, so that's what I'm going to do. So my story starts back when I was uh, in college at UC Berkeley. I took this computer science course in compilers and there was this guest lecturer from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, this kind of mad scientist guy who would work all night and come in in the morning and teach the class, which was in our morning. It was this fellow, Van Jacobson, who was doing um, this, this interesting network research up there before the internet existed, before the web existed. And at the end of the term, um, I liked the class. I liked, uh, I liked Van a lot and his style, and he had an opening in his group for a summer job. So I landed in this great group. It was a great place and a great time in internet history. I was, I was very lucky to be involved with Van and not just Van and, and his network research group, but a couple of other um, really um, great colleagues, Vern Paxson and Sally Floyd. And this group did some really incredible things. Um, the, this is just a few of, few of the projects uh, the group produced. I put in red some of the stuff I was involved in, but um, Vern worked on a compiler tool called Flex. Uh, which was quite a while ago and which I think was the reason Berkeley invited Van to, to teach the compilers course. Of course, Van has done his uh, seminal work on TCP congestion control, slow start and so forth. He did the header compression stuff in C-slip. Um, I worked on the, B the Berkeley packet filter BPF, TCP dump and PCAP, which I'm going to talk about. Van wrote these great tools, trace route and path care. Um, Vern did this very early intrusion detection system called BRO. Um, we work on SDP and SIP. Spent a lot of time on the real-time transport protocol, RTP, which as you know is the foundation for voice over IP. That work was embodied in a set of um, audio and video conferencing tools that worked over IP multicast or the multicast backbone called the Mbone tools, VIC, BAT, and WB. Um, the whiteboard application needed a reliable transport over a multicast protocol, so we worked on reliable transport protocols for, for multicast. A lot of this work needed the support of network simulation, so I wrote a network, simulation, network simulator called NS um, that, that has actually been used quite a bit in the research community. Sally and Van worked on these protocols like class-based queuing and random early drop routers. Um, and of course, Van was one of the big uh, early thought leaders of the whole diff-serve approach to QoS for IP networks. So a pretty amazing time, a pretty amazing group. I'm very lucky to spend those years um, surrounded by these great researchers. Um, so when I first joined the group that summer, Van was just uh, wrapping up his work on TCP congestion control. He had spent the last couple of years figuring out why the ARPANET would sort of seize up under, under too much load and completely stop working. Um, and he figured out, you know, we needed to add congestion control to TCP, slow start, and the congestion avoidance algorithms. Um, and to do that work, of course, he needed to look at the packets on the network. So he needed packet capture tools. And we had Sun workstations back at the time, and then there was this tool, EtherFind, that came with Sun OS. And I think Van was a bit frustrated with it because it had a few problems. Um, it, it sort of had this clumsy filtering syntax um, for looking at what you wanted to, to look at. Um, the protocol decoding and printing wasn't, uh, wasn't very good, and it was kind of cryptic, and it had, it had really um, horrible performance. And so let me motivate the performance problem here. You know, you'd be trying to study a low bandwidth connection running over a wide area network like the ARPANET, and so you'd fire up EtherFind on your Sun workstation, 
Etherfind would put your Ethernet interface in promiscuous mode. Back then, we had broadcast Ethernets, not switched Ethernets. So you get all the LAN traffic, all the file server traffic, everything going over your, your Ethernet, coming up the stack, up to the process that was doing the packet capture and overwhelming the host. And so you'd lose the very packets um, you were trying to study because it'd be overwhelmed with this, this local area traffic. So, so we figured there, there must be a better way, and Van set me out to work on, on a different model that was inspired by this idea of filtering packets down in the operating system um, before they came up the stack and had a chance to overwhelm uh, the workstation. And, and this was kind of a, inspired by some work Jeff Mogul did, I think, actually here at Stanford and Dave Cheriton's group. Um, the new idea was to take that filtering model and put a high-level language on top of it, and you would compile the high-level language into the low-level filter that would be downloaded into the kernel. We called the kernel module the Berkeley Packet Filter, or BPF. And so then the network monitoring tool running on the Sun workstation looked something like this, where you had your network interface, your device driver, you had your TCP stack, and you had BPF kind of sandwiched in between. Um, if you wanted to run an experiment and capture the packets of just the connection you were looking at, you'd run TCP dump, hand it a filter, for example, that would pick out, say, the FTP data packets coming from a particular FTP server on the, on the ARPANET. You would, um, TCP dump would translate that into a BPF program that would get downloaded into the kernel. You'd fire up your FTP program to pull the, the data across a TCP connection that you were then trying to study the, the protocol dynamics of. And TCP dump would grab all of those packets of just that one connection that you were interested in and block all of the, the, the heavyweight LAN traffic from going up the stack. And you wouldn't miss any packets to be able to solve your problem. Um, so then it would, of course, display it for the user or be able to save the packets straight to the file system for later, later um, analysis. So, so this is what we set out to build. And the first thing. I needed to do was design a virtual machine model that would run in the kernel and, and execute these filters. And I wanted to keep it simple. And um, I had some experience uh, actually back from my junior high days writing machine code for the, for the old Apple II, um, which was based on the old Motorola 6502. And so I modeled this machine, um, virtual machine architecture after the 6502. So it would have an accumulator an index register. The memory model would be based on the packets, so it would have load instructions that would load information out of packets into the accumulator, and then you'd do arithmetic and conditional logic um, on, the, on the data that was loaded into these registers. So here's an example of, of a program, a filter program that followed that architecture. This, this filter matches FTP data packets for some host, 20020, and the basic idea is the The packet um, comes in, and the, the filter runs on the packet. And the first thing that, the, the, that this thing does is try to figure out, is this packet, this Ethernet packet, an, actually an IP packet, since we're looking for FTP packets, and FTP packets are IP packets. So it loads um, a 16-bit value at offset 12, out of, which is in the Ethernet header and where the Ethernet protocol type is, into the accumulator. And then it compares that value to uh, hex 800, which is the type for IP, um, and if that succeeds, it moves on to the next instruction. And so the next instruction is to check the IP source address. So it'll pull the source address out of the right place of the IP packet, do that comparison. That comparison fails in this case. Then we compare the dest address, and we repeat this process. That, that one matched. Now we've, now we've determined it's an IP packet, and it's, the address is 20020, so now we have to figure out if it's a TCP packet. So the next step is to pull the IP protocol field out which into the accumulator, compare that to 6, which is the type for TCP. And then, so it's a TCP packet. And now there's this interesting uh, problem, which is IP datagrams can be fragmented. And the TCP header of a fragmented datagram is only going to be in the first fragment. And so you want to check if the packet has either not been fragmented or it's the first fragment of um, a fragmented datagram. And so you do that by checking that the IP fragment offset is zero. So let's assume in that case that succeeded. And now there's another tricky problem, which is the IP header can be variable length. So you can't just do a load at a fixed offset in the packet. 
So what you actually have to do is load the IP header length into this index register, um, and then do a load of that header length plus a constant, which gets you to the right place in the packet to pull the IP, the TCP source port out and compare that. So let's assume that in this case it didn't succeed. So we go to the next check and load the destination port in the same way. And finally, let's assume that check succeeded. And ultimately, the filter would return true to the BPF sus subsystem and it would accept that pack packet for processing. If any of those tests failed, it would hit the last instruction, return false, and reject the packet and discard it. So this BPF virtual machine model is a completely flexible, programmable way to do packet filtering um, and, and could be pretty efficient. Um, but you'd never want to write these low-level BPF programs every time you went to run TCP dump or, or some other packet capture application. So instead of writing all this out, the idea is to be able to write these high-level expressions and have a compiler and perhaps an optimization system translate those high-level filter expressions into these BPF programs. And this is where things got a little bit tricky. Um, designing the language and parser so it was easy to use um, for users turned out to be kind of a hard problem. Um, and I have this, this sort of uh, saying that I have at, at Riverbed where I, I like to challenge our engineers or our product management teams that, you know, it, it's easy to make things hard um, and it's hard to make things easy. And usually it's better to do the latter. And if I think about my career and the first time I was challenged in this way, I think I learned it from Van, even though we didn't use these words to describe it. And so I want to kind of motivate, motivate this lesson by walking through um, the challenges I faced when I, when I designed this language and the parser and the optimization system. So, so let me start from the basic primitive component in the BPF language, which is this idea of a predicate, where you've got a field specification followed by a value. And a field can be, a, is a protocol followed by a direction followed by a selector, where the protocol is something like Ethernet or IP or TCP. A direction is source or destination or neither, which means both, either. Um, or, and the selector is host, net, and port. And so examples of this are things like IP source host 10001. And what this means is if the field in the IP source address in the IP packet header is 10001, then this expression is true. Otherwise, it's false. Likewise, TCP test port 80 means if the destination port field in the TCP header is 80, then this predicate is true. Otherwise, it's false. And so the idea was to take these predicates and stitch them together with logical operations like or, and, not, and parentheses, and so forth. And so I could take a predicate like IP source host X and not port 80, and that would give me all of the traffic from server X that wasn't port 80 web traffic. And so the way you write a compiler for a language like this, or the, there's these great compiler construction tools that can take a high level representation of a grammar, it's called, that looks something like this, and generate a C implementation of, of the parser. And so it was really straightforward to take this predicate concept and the logical operations and write a grammar that, that would that would implement this language. The problem is Van didn't like it. He thought it was a little too clunky to have to, if, I, if he wanted to look at all the traffic from, say, three hosts X, Y, or Z, to, type, to have to type IP source host X, or IP source host Y, or IP source host Z. So he said, what I want to do is be able to type IP source host X, or Y, or Z. Seems simple enough. So, how would you structure this with a grammar? Um, well, I thought you could have two layers of logic. You could have a lower layer of logic that would be these predicates that would mix in different values for the given predicate. And then you can have an upper layer of logic that would mix together the predicates with logical operations as well. And so if you were write, to write the grammar down, it's pretty easy to think about how that might look. You write it like this. This is the upper layer of expressions that take terms, let's call them, um, which are, is the lower layer of predicates with values tacked on in these logical operations. So this should work just fine, but it didn't work at all. <laughs> and the problem is the way these parser generation tools work is 
they need to be able to look ahead just one symbol and make a decision about how to parse a certain incoming sentence or incoming set of, of terms. And the problem was the parser needed to decide at this point, are we talking about a term or are we talking about an expression? And make that decision before it got too far ahead. And it, it turned out that this was sort of a fundamental problem and property of the language that Van was after that it wasn't going to be amenable to do this, this two-layer structure. Um, and so I said, well, why don't I go back to the language and put some constraints on it so the parser would be easier to build? And so maybe we could require parentheses or curly braces, and if you did that, then the parser would work right. Or maybe have different ways of, of different ands and ors so I could distinguish the different layers, or maybe a period or some kind of terminator symbol to end one kind of part of the parse and start the other. And so I was looking for an easy way out that was going to make this clunky syntax be imposed on, on the users of the tool. Um, and Van didn't like that. So he challenged me and said there must be a way to figure it out. And I spent a week or two sort of frustratingly trying to play with different approaches to the grammar. And I went back to him and I said, it's not possible. This isn't going to work out. Um, but finally, I, with enough uh, effort, I, I, I came up with a solution uh, that, that seemed to work. And so the idea was not to try to structure things in two layers, but have a single layer and allow these predicates, um, allow the expressions to be built up at one layer and have the predicates be tacked on or additional values be tacked on. And so the grammar is very simple. It looks like this. And so the idea is you have this ex expression that starts from a predicate and then you could tack predicates or values on to the expression you're building up using, um, using this grammar. Um, the problem was it, it then, while that worked from a grammatical structure, it then became a little bit tricky to figure out how code would actually be generated using this grammar. And so let me kind of motivate that problem here a little bit. Um, so the other thing these compiler construction tools allow you to do is is associate actions with each of the rules in the grammar. And so don't worry about all these dollars and everything, but basically what this is doing is it's saying, let's gen generate code to do a comparison of this field in the packet to this value. Um, and then we'll, this dollar dollar means we'll take the code and we'll stick it in the parse stack so that as we parse little bits of code and hook them together, it can all come together. Um, and so, so at this layer in the, in the language, it was really obvious that, well, here's the field. This is how I generate the code. And for these rules up here, it was really obvious to say, let's take the code of an, of an expression and a predicate and stitch them together with an operation to, to and together these two pieces of code. But was, what was difficult was trying to figure out, well, what do I do here? Because I've got this value and I need to do one of these things, but I don't have the field information to tell me, to tell me how, to, how to generate that code. And so, I'm getting a little bit into the details here. If you think about the parse stack and the idea of the code living on the parse stack inside the, inside the parse, parser implementation, the idea to solve this problem was to put alongside with the code this field indication information that would remember in the stack as the parse was occurring what field you were working on, whether it was the IP source host, the TCP, TCP desk port, and so forth. And in that way, without going into the details of all of this, you could remember the state of the field on the parse stack so that when you got up here and were parsing a, attaching a value to new expression, you could pull that information out of the parse stack and generate code that would, would take care of the comparison. I'll skip over this. So if I look at now how this all worked in terms of, a, of the parse of a given piece of input, let me walk through um, what the parser does. So the way these parsers work is they read the input left to right, they keep pushing symbols on the stack until there's a rule in the grammar that, that can mash, match what is on the top of the stack. So here we see IP source host, we found a protocol of direction of selector, so that's a field. And so what, what the system will do is it will store some state on the parse stack to remember that we're talking about the IP source host field um, in, in this expression. It will then push the value x onto the stack, and at this point, it'll match this rule, and we can generate code for an IP source host comparison to value x. And that's what this will do here. 
and that code will be stored on the stack in, in terms of this symbol C1. And then the part that'll change, it'll then change the predicate to an expression and continue the parse, pushing more values on. And now we recognize this expression. And this was the tricky one, where now we have the IP source host state along with this value Y, and we could use all that information to, to generate the right check to the field and then the, the logical comparison with, with the two different codes. And we end up with a new piece of code that represents that expression. We continue on here. We see TCP desk port and the process com, uh, continues similarly where now we put on the stack an indication, some state that, re, that we remember we were processing the TCP desk port field. We push value Z and we could generate code that represents that comparison as well. Ultimately, and these two pieces together and output the BPF code that represents that expression. And so I figured out a way to build this parser and construct, construct a language that would be um, hopefully easy, easy to use for the users. Um, now what I want to do is walk through some example of what those parser actions are actually doing in terms of generating code, um, which will motivate then the need for optimization. And I'll talk a little bit about how, how the optimization system then works. So, so let's start with a very simple, um, one of these predicates where, again, TCP source port is the field and 100 is the value. And I'm going to demonstrate this or illustrate this in terms of a control flow graph. And so this is what all of those parser actions would generate um, as the parser was running. A control flow graph that represents these checks we, we walk through in the example. Is the packet IP? Is it fragment zero? Is it TCP? And is the source port 100? If all those checks are true, then the filter evaluates to true. If any of them are false, then the filter, the predicate is false. So what if you wanted to do, say something more complicated, like I don't care about traffic just from source port 100, but either from source port 100 or desk port 100. And the way you say that in TCP dump is you just say TCP port 100, and it gets translated by the compiler into an or of these two um, sub-predicates. And what the compiler ends up doing behind the scenes is, is it says, okay, I'll create this widget for TCP source port, I'll create this widget for TCP desk port, and then I'll or them together by stitching together the logic such that if this is true, the whole um, compound predicate is true, and if this is false, we check this one, and if this is true, this is true, and this is false. Now let's say I want to look at packets between port 100 and port 200. So there I could say, um, there what the compiler would do is do a TCP port 100 and TCP port 200, and the output just keeps getting ever more complex. So what the compiler does under the hood is it takes this gadget for TCP port 100 and it makes another one for TCP port 200, and now instead of oring them together, ands them together. And so the, if, if this is true, we go over here and check that that's true, and then the whole thing will be true. If either of them are false, then the, then the um, compound predicate is false. And so if you sort of take, take all of that logic and blow it up, it looks something like this and the raw code looks like this. So it's a bunch of complicated goop to do what seems, should be a, a fairly simple kind of uh, uh, filtering process on, on, on these packets. And if you look closely at how all of this got stitched together along this red path, what ends up happening is you end up redundantly checking the same thing many times. And so this motivates the idea that, well, gee, maybe we should take this code and apply some optimization algorithms. Um, to it. So the idea is the code generator will generate kind of this clunky, inefficient code, um, and then you have an optimization path that takes that as input, optimizes it, and hopefully spits out much more efficient code. And there were a bunch of, you know, well-known techniques from, for optimization. I learned in my compilers course. I went and read some papers on some of the stuff that wasn't standard and, um, and began to implement a bunch of stuff in the optimization module in, in, in TCP dump. And one of the techniques that's pretty well known um, is this idea um, of doing global data flow analysis in a compiler with, with a data structure or a set relationship called a dominator. And the idea of a dominator, uh, the dominator set is a node, say this node one, is said to dominate another node if you know you had to have gone through that node to get to the other node. So in this case, in this graph, node one dominates all the other nodes because you had to go through it. In this case, two doesn't dominate anything because you're not guaranteed to have gone through two, and three dominates four and five. 
And so you can use this dominator set relationship, and it's easy to compute with a simple algorithm, um, to do interesting optimizations. And one of them that TCP dump does is called global common sub-expression elimination. And this is a very simple example where if you know there's a bit of computation that occurred in node one, and then later you got to node two, and you, you computed a similar bit of information, that you can make a transformation here to replace this x equals b plus c with x equals a because you know on entry to node two that the value in a is the same as the value you're computing here. And so I, I coded up a bunch of these standard optimization techniques and started to look at the output that these optimization algorithms were giving, but it was still producing kind of inefficient um, uh, output, and, um, and so I, what I started to realize was that there was, a, there was a problem that wasn't being captured with a dominator's concept. And so here is an example of a graph, sorry, this got messed up a little bit, um, where there's, say, a predicate check for this, this value A, and if that's true, we go over here, check for B, and if that's false, we come back here and we check for A again. Now, knowing that this top node dominated this yellow node here doesn't help me eliminate this check because I could have taken this path or I could have taken this blue path. And so I ended up with these graphs after doing all these, these BPF programs after doing all of this optimization with this kind of redundancy left. And so I thought about, well, how could I fix this? And I came up with this idea that if instead of looking at the dominator relationships between the nodes, I looked at the dominator relationships between the edges, I could actually solve this problem. And I went down to see Professor Sue Graham at, at UC Berkeley, who was the expert in compilers and languages, and I asked her about this, and I said, surely this must be out there, and I, and I can just leverage what other people have done. And she said, well, no, um, it isn't. Um, so at the time, this, this technology wasn't out there. Nowadays, these are all solved problems, but it wasn't available at the time. And so in this graph, I've now numbered all the edges, and you can compute the EDOM sets that says, if I've gone through edge one, I know that edge one dominates three and four, you know, because to get to three or four, I have to have gone through one. And the other two sets here are empty, because um, I could have come through this path. And with this information, I can start to do interesting things. If I look at this edge three here, I know because three is an EDOM of one, this edge here, and one is the true leg of the A test, I know that at three, that predicate of A is true. So I can move three to point to the true, true output of A. So I can move three to point down to D. And then an interesting hap thing happens, which is now that I've moved this edge, these EDOM sets are no longer, they, they, they've changed. So if I update them, um, I see new opportunities for optimization. So here, in this case, now I can look at, I've updated this, and now EDOM two um, is actually five and six because this edge has been moved. So I can look at two here and say, okay, at five, I know A is uh, false, so I can move two to point down to C. And I can make that move. And then I could notice, well, gee, this test for A now is no longer even reached or used, so I can delete it, and I've now simplified the graph. So I've used this idea of edge dominators, um, this new idea at the time, to do these interesting optimizations to these logical control flow graphs. And if we go back to this big complicated object, now armed with this edge dominator concept, we can simplify it quite a bit. So if you look at this red edge here with respect to these three pink tests, um, we know that all of these tests were true, so if we come down along this part, we're going to know all of, all of the true um, edges here are going to be taken. So we can move this red edge down here. Likewise, for this edge up here, the same thing happens, and we can move it over to there. Let me use this. Um, for here, the same thing happens. We can move that down there. Um, over here, for these three edges, they're all false, so we know they come down here. Um, and then we notice that this code is not reached, so we can delete it. Um, likewise, for this edge here, we could move it over here. And now we see that all of this code is not reached, so we can delete that too. And now an interesting different kind of thing happens here. We get down to this point, and we're checking for source port 100. We take this path if it's true, so we know the source port is 100. 
Here we're checking that is the source port 200. Well, it can't be 200 if we know it was 100. So we use the EDOM relationship to move this edge down here. And we can do the same thing and move this edge as well. So now we, ended up, we, we took that big complicated graph. We used the edge dominator concept with some algorithms to move edges around. And we have a fairly tight, pretty optimal um, flow graph for, for computing or for matching packets between two, two TCP ports. And so the code before looked like this. And the code after is this, this nice, efficient, um, shorter program. So I built this cool parser for this uh, novel language, um, came up with these novel optimization algorithms. We had this cool stuff. And we thought, well, gee, there's all this great infrastructure in TCP dump now. Why don't we take it out, um, pull out the compiler system and the filtering engine, uh, create an API for that infrastructure, wrap it in its own library. Um, and that became the PCAP library that, that we released. And I read, wrote TCP dump so it would use the PCAP library. And then if different applications were going to be built across this common library, it made sense that we should have a common file format for, for, um, for these, for these um, packet traces. And that became the, the PCAP file format, was, which was really just an elaboration of the original dash W flag in TCP dump. Um, we released it as open source, TCP dump, BPF, libpcap. It got ported to a bunch of different operating systems. It, it, pieces of it made its way into Linux and ultimately Mac OS. Published a couple of papers on it. And then I just want to kind of wrap up things with an apology. Um, at some point, I was reading uh, Rich Stevens' TCP IP Illustrated and realized he had a whole chapter on PCAP. And I thought, oh no, that, that, that API was never cleaned up and finished. And, and here we go. Um, but the good thing about open source is people took it and, and cleaned it up and made it better. Um, on the other hand, it's harder to clean up and fix a file format that gets ingrained and you have all these files around. And so Loris tells me I screwed up the key, PCAP file format. So I don't know. I was just a college kid. What can I say? I'm sorry. So anyway, that's, that's my story. I'm very honored and excited to be working with the case team and the community. Um, one of the fun things in, in taking the case products and the riverbed visibility products we had and putting them together and taking them to market was seeing that there, there is actually, you know, I would have thought after all these years, a lot of these problems would be solved if it would be a mature field. But there's plenty of room for innovation, and, and that's exciting. There's a lot of, of, of interesting, fun things I think we're doing. So I'm excited to looking. And looking forward to working with Loris, Gerald, and, and, and the open source community to continue to push the envelope. And just if there's anything, one thing to take away from my talk here, it, it's this idea that it's, it's hard to make things easy, but it's usually the right way to go. Thanks.